two reasons. First, because digital literacy is an area very, very close to my heart um, and a field that I'm interested in as a researcher. Um, so the second reason is that this is the first talk I've been um, I've given since since March. Uh, that is not about online learning. So since the pandemic uh, started, I've given so many keynotes and presentations and trainings all on the topic of online learning and blended learning and hybrid learning. Of course, in order to help language professionals um, shift um, smoothly. Uh, or as smooth <laughs> as realistically possible um, to this new uh, reality. So I'm very happy that this is not about online learning for a change, but of course um, it can be applied to online learning and teaching because online uh, is the perfect context for digital literacies. That said, we need digital literacies in the face-to-face -face classroom as well. So while um, I'll be presenting, um, you may want to think about both contexts um, during the lockdown and post uh, lockdown. So <clears throat> about me, uh, both Kevin and uh, Divina uh, introduced me, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, just to say that uh, <clears throat> I've been working as a digital learning specialist for years, and I'm also a teacher trainer and a researcher, but most of all, <clears throat> I hope I won't lose my voice. So most of all, I identify myself as a teacher. Um, I still teach in higher education, uh, not full-time, um, uh, not a full-time lecturer, uh, but uh, much of what I'll be talking about comes both from research, but also from classroom experience. So I think it is very useful to not just talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Um, so I'm going to share with you at the end all my contact details if you want to get in touch or follow my work. But for now, if you're going to be tweeting, this is my Twitter handle, Sophia Ma. So I'm going to share a story with you. Um, uh, last year in January uh, 2020, um, I gave a keynote at the Grand Bet at Excel in London. Have you ever heard of this conference, BET, in London? Have you ever heard? Have you ever visited? Yes, of course, Joe, of course you have. So it is a really, really big, big, massive conference about educational technology, Olinka, yes, Peter, yes. So it, it is massive. Um, so uh, the title uh, of the keynote was uh, Digital Residence or the Distracted Generation, and it was about helping students to manage digital distractions. How to manage, you know, the distractions from social media and all the digital distractions, te texts, etc. So, and uh, the recording is in the references, and uh, if you want to, um, to watch the recording, you will be able to. So, um, in this keynote, one year ago, I challenged the educational systems that simply banned digital devices from the classroom in an attempt to manage students' digital distractions. I argued that managing digital distractions is a learning skill that needs to be developed in the context of learning in the classroom. And that by banning devices, we also deprive students of the opportunity to develop this skill in the context of learning. So most specific, specifically in 2019, the French government passed a law banning mobile phones across all schools in France. It was not the only country, Canada, some schools across the UK and other European countries such as Spain, Greece, um, also the United States were enacting or thinking about enacting similar policies. Treating the symptom, not the problem. 
So that was back in January 2020. In less than two months, in March 2020, at least in Europe, uh, it was the same educational systems that asked students to move online and use their devices for learning. And they were blaming them for being distracted by Instagram and TikTok instead of focusing on the lesson. But then they could not simply ban the devices from the classroom because their classroom was in the devices. So why am I saying this, uh, all this? Why am I sharing this story with you? Because I believe that many of the issues and the struggles that teachers experience right now, teaching online or remotely, would have been avoided if educational systems had been more proactive with regards to the skills that students need when they use technology. I'm not saying that they should have been proactive about predicting the pandemic. This was beyond any imagination. But understanding that the con concept of literacy, what it means to be literate in the 21st century, is shifting to include digital literacies as well. And somehow included in the curricula um, taking into, into consideration what it means uh, to be literate in the 21st century. So, enter the story and um, just a short overview, we are going to, um, to look at, um, we're going to define digital literacies and then I'm going to share uh, a digital literacies uh, framework and um, look at it, analyze it, and then we are going to talk about digital literacies in the language classroom. We're going, I'm going to share some practical ideas about integrating digital literacies. And of course, there, there's going to be a 10 minute Q&A at the end where you can ask me questions about um, the, uh, what has been presented. So, um, typically, perhaps in the 20th century, being literate meant the ability to read and write and understand numbers. But the concept of literacy is changing, is shifting. Scholars from cognitive science, sociolinguistics, um, information technology, IT, uh, digital humanities, uh, pedagogy. All scholars seem to agree that the concept of literacy in the 21st century is, increasing, is increasingly shifting, changing to include new skills, new values, competences associated with the role of technology in human life. It is difficult to speak anymore uh, about the offline and the online world as two different separate uh, things. And I think that the pandemic made this very clear that the online and the offline worlds increasingly intersect to become one world where we work, learn, communicate, etc. So if we perceive um, literacy, not that as, as a static thing, as a static ability to deal with texts um, and, you know, and the written uh, world, but as an intellectual empowerment, a person who is literate is intellectually empowered, um, that can change, you know, our cognitive uh, and our, 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 our can change us uh, cognitively and socially, then in the same way, digital literacies cannot be seen our, as just the skills for using computers. It is so much more than this. So I found this uh, definition very comprehensive and I think that it hits home uh, for us language professionals. So digital literacy, uh, we refer to the skills to use, create and critique digital technologies and the knowledge to critically understand the structures and syntax of the digital world and to be confident in managing new social norms. So 
critique digital technology. So we're not talking about knowing how to use computers, how to use Zoom, how to use this tool or how to use that tool, social media, how to create videos, and all these amazing things that need technical skills. They are amazing. Of course, we do need to know some, some of these technical uh, things. Uh, but we and students also need to understand the syntax and the structures and for us language professionals we we know that this uh, doesn't just mean to speak a language eh? um, and also critique information and manage social norms in order to live and navigate the world that we live in so also something very very important research overwhelmingly confirms that exposure to um, technology does not equal understanding technology, understanding this, um, what I described, the syntax and the structures. Just because we are online or our students are online doesn't mean that they have this deep understanding that I just described. And even before the pandemic, our students spend three to four hours uh, online per day, and this is uh, documented and researched, uh, but they still got distracted by technologies, uh, social media, fell for fake news, were cyberbullied, plagiarized, didn't know how their data was used online. And there is no such thing as digital natives either. So this term was coined by Kransky in 20, uh, 2001 to refer to a distinction between the young and the old. But recent uh, papers and research and Kransky himself acknowledged that this, this, this term oversimplifies things and that the picture is far more complex and that fluency, be, being a fluent user of technology, exposure, using technology a lot, and technical competence, you, knowing how to use Zoom, knowing how to create a video, does not mean digital literacy, okay? Uh, it might be part of digital literacy, as we will see uh, in a bit, but this is not the whole picture. So there are many frameworks, and this is um, a complete framework that I designed, and we will take a closer look in a bit, in a very interactive way, I promise. It's not going to be uh, me uh, talking, talking all the time. Uh, so be prepared to participate. So it is, it is important to say here that digital literacy cannot be transmitted or acquired at once. It is a lived experience and involves online participation. So we cannot say that, um, you know, uh, we are going to teach digital literacy without computers. So this is out of the question. It is, these are not only theoretical concepts. So participation, of course, uh, involves computers. As I said, it, it is mediated by, uh, by computers, but it is not just about skills. It is an intellectual empowerment. So we are talking about, of course, access. And as I said, we're going to take a very close look at all of them. So access and core IT skills, participation and collaboration, creativity and innovation, uh, identity and well-being, and digital criticality. Of course, you. I'm sure you understand that for each of these literacies, uh, in order to uh, acquire a very good understanding, you may need a, an MA dissertation, perhaps a PhD dissertation. So today, what we're going to do is frame these literacies. Um, and uh, of course, you, uh, you uh, will be able to ask questions. So all these literacies are of course important, uh, we need them all, but um, we need to be realistic about what we can and what we cannot do as, as language teachers. The idea here is not to turn our language students into digital literacy experts. 
that would be unrealistic. But I see two aims here for us um, language professionals. First, to equip our students with the learning skills that they need to learn a language. They need these skills to learn a language in the 21st century. Second, uh, to help them develop one of the most important set of 21st century skills. Uh, so to, to make learning relevant to them. These are the skills that they need now and they will need in the future. And someone might ask, okay, Sophia, what are you talking about? Can we not learn a language without being digitally literate? Of course we can. But here there are other questions. What is a language? What does it mean to learn a language? Are languages separate? from the world that we live in? Or do they reflect cognitive, social norms and interactions? For example, if we learn a language to communicate, then we do need digital literacies. If we are using the internet to read, to view in the target language, uh, to connect with people and exchange ideas. So simply put, um, as educators, we need to ensure that what we teach is what people actually need for their real lives in the real world. So this is Michael Carrier. This is from his um, uh, foreword from the recent book I co-edited, English for 21st Century Skills, and you will find it in the references. And I think it sums it all up very, very nicely. So, but enough. Uh, from me, I want to hear or read from you. Uh, so let's take one, one um, digital literacy at a time. Um, so uh, I said one, but <laughs> these are two actually, access and core IT skills. What do you think that these literacies involve? Access and core IT skills, over to you. So what do you think that they involve? Come on, come on. I'm waiting. How to use technology. Thank you, ability to get online. Basic knowledge, very good. Give me some examples. What do we mean basic knowledge? Being able, copying and pasting, excellent. Using technology for a purpose. Managing passwords, good. Turn on Zoom. Thank you, Mary. Yes, that was a very, uh, you know, concrete example. Research, uploading documents. Yes, uploading email etiquette. Knowing that, yeah, being active in digital world. Very good, Ron. How to use Google. Thank you, Ron. Presentations using slides. Excellent. Thank you. Keep them coming. I will cut up. Excellent. So, these are some examples, access and core IT skills from the, this is the, the basis of digital literacies. We cannot be digitally literate if we don't have access to technology, if, if we don't have basic core IT skills, because this represents the ability to read and write in the analog world. Um, this is where we start from. This includes access to fast and affordable internet as well as devices and some confidence in basic IT skills. You don't need to be a guru, but you need to know how to search, for example. Um, and of course, because this access is not equal around the world, we have the so-called digital divides. And there were digital divides before the pandemic, not just in the third world, countries, but also in Western countries like the USA and the UK, but the pandemic made them more apparent. So um, for some students, this is where they need to start from. And I don't mean that they need the latest iPad or MacBook, but they do need decent bandwidth to be able to develop digital literacies. Of course, before the pandemic, if a student didn't have a fast internet at home, they could go to a cafe or library. Unfortunately, COVID has exposed many 
disparities and divisions in this regard. So I live and work in the UK and not all of my students have the same access to decent internet and devices. So this is something that society needs to work on after the pandemic, uh, definitely. But with regards to, um, to basic skills, you can see uh, some of them um, on the slide. They need electricity as well. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, exactly. So next question for you guys, participation and collaboration. What do students need to know to participate and collaborate effectively online? What do they need to know? Over to you. What do they need to know? Can, can, can anyone collaborate online? Um, what do you need to, to collaborate? Netiquette, thank you. Teamwork, thank you, Ron. Teamwork, specific to perhaps online learning. Clear rules, how to use collaborative tools. Thank you, Lenka, exactly. Uh, roles, confidence, what tools to use, communication skills, writing in English or in any language, eh? in any language, in the target language. Thank you, Mary, excellent. Excellent listening skills. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I, I agree uh, with all the points that you have raised. Participation and collaboration literacies, of course, can provide students with the skills and mindset. It's not just the skills to use shared productivity tools such as Google Drive, Microsoft, for example, communicate and collaborate effectively online via text video, audio, not just text, understand different genres and codes of digital interaction, for example, email versus text. There are different codes of communication there. We use emoticons as paralinguistic features to show emotion, otherwise text can be misunderstood. And there have been lots of misunderstandings of tone, uh, people that they were very well intentioned, but their text came across aggressive. It's just one emoticon that you need. Um, uh, respect diverse uh, cultural uh, norms. Uh, another example, we don't post 10 selfies a day because we know uh, that this is bad taste it comes across as desperate. I'm not here to judge anyone. I'm talking about digital cultures and codes of communication is what you project to, uh, to people who see what they see. Uh, we know how to build digital networks to participate in professional and social life. Uh, personal learning networks, and many people from here are from my uh, PLN, my personal learning network, and I have learned so many things with and from them. Um, what can we do to promote these literacies as language educators? So think about this as we move on. Um, let's move on. Okay, so we have creativity and innovation. What can students create with technology and why is it important? You can answer both questions or just pick one of these questions and answer. What can they create with the Oh, yes, wrong, content. Exactly, with capital letters. Exactly, totally agree. They can create content. What else can they create with technology? What else can they create? Think about uh, networks, very good, excellent. Content, can you give me some forms of this content? Excellent, so let's start from the content. Photo stories to share, thank you, Mary. Mind maps, exactly, exactly. So, exactly, so, <clears throat> Creativity, sorry, <clears throat> creativity and innovation literacies, of course, 
can equip our students with the competencies and skills and mindset of designing, remixing, creating, and curating digital uh, media and resources, content, um, web pages, images, audio. Think about the different media, um, audio, video, music, apps, graphics, coding is a great literacy, but this doesn't mean that we all need to know how to code or that our students need to know how to code or learn uh, from us, for example. Um, so very relevant to us is using technology to support research and problem solving and create content, as Ron said. So do our students have these literacies? They might be able to design and remix but can they synthesize this by respecting authorship and ownership, for example? That's a question for you. So let's move on. Ooh, this is massive. Identity and well being. What are the challenges that students may face regarding? digital well-being, responsibility, and safety. Over to you. Yes, yes, Gina, it is a very hot topic. Uh, online, offline lives, thank you, Catherine, exactly. Cyberbullying, exactly, for, for, for Florencia. What else? What are the challenges? You mentioned identity, and I couldn't agree. Digital footprint. Thank you, Catherine. Keep them coming. Cultural perspectives, amount of screen time. Thank you, John. Exactly. So there are some very, very important questions here. And I would say that uh, these literacies are about understanding the reputational implications of existing online of, of digital identity. And these uh, reputational implications, we're talking about both opportunities and risks. We should not be focusing on the negatives because this is not true. There are lots of opportunities and I think that the pandemic made this even more apparent. There wouldn't be any continuity without the opportunities. Um, but we do need to raise awareness and help students to develop skills to become, to be resilient to risks because the risks are very real. You can't avoid risk. Uh, for example, managing digital distractions, developing a positive digital footprint, managing um, personal data, developing e-safety skills, especially for um, those of you who teach teenagers and young learners, um, handling cyberbullying. Someone mentioned that both reactively and proactively. And apart from the mechanisms and helplines and support that are the school system's responsibility, not ours exactly, we need to develop kids' and students' ability to deal with cyberbullying, to know how to report it, not to be scared, because this is what bullies and trolls, not only bullies, trolls, there are many trolls online. Um, this is what they want to, 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 to scare you. So <clears throat> this is easier said than done, of course. And um, that's why raising awareness is not enough. Students need the skills to do that. And um, yes, yes, Angie. So moving on, digital criticality. What does it mean for language students? What do they need to be able to do? Digital criticality, that's a big one also. Curate, very good. What is true online and what is not true? Thank you, Florencia. 
understand the news and the fake news, Catherine, exactly. Mary, being critical about the sources of information. Yes, yes, Google Translate. <laughs> yeah, not avoid online translation tools, but, but use them effectively. Thank you. Thank you, John. Exactly. So uh, that's massive. And which digital literacy is not massive. Um, so digital criticality, of course, equips uh, students with the skills and the confidence to assess, as you very well said, uh, source reliability, as well as to analyze and interpret information online. And with the onset of COVID-19, the ability to identify, to identify fake news has become more than ever a matter of life and death, for example, lots of fake news. So um, digital criticality, some people ask me, teachers, colleagues uh, ask me, uh, digital criticality is critical thinking, isn't it? And my answer is no, not only. You need to know the digital well because messages come out in various forms, not just text. It can be links, it can be hyperlinks, it can be pop-ups, it can be video, it can be sound, it can be image, it can be photoshopped image. So you need to know the digital media well to develop this digital criticality. Now, Identify uh, and deal with echo chambers. So, so what do we mean by echo chambers? Anyone? Do you know? Okay, yeah, no idea, no problem. Telling, someone said it telling me what I want to hear, Ron, Ron, thank you. People who have the same opinions as you, Beatrice, exactly, those sharing similar views, John, yes, yes, yes. And uh, Joe, sharing opinions with people who agree with you. <laughs> exactly, that's it. So the information that we consume, that's a very, very, very big area. And I will attempt to just, just touch it here. So the information that we consume online is increasingly mediated by filter bubbles, algorithms whose job is to make content increasingly personalized through guessing what the user would like to see. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, another example is our PLNs, eh? our personal learning networks. Uh, we tend to follow like-minded uh, people, and rightly so. Um, however, this uh, creates online environments that are populated by essentially agreeable information. And these are our echo chambers. So echo chambers are not new and they exist offline as well. But the exposure and the reach is so massive online that it has given echo chambers a whole new meaning. So what's the idea here? We cannot change the world. We cannot change algorithms, but understanding when you are in a bubble and when you are not is essential. And also from time to time, breaking out of our echo chambers and being exposed to more diverse ideas and perspectives is a major digital literacy that needs a high level of digital criticality. So echo chambers cannot be avoided, as I said, but need a certain level of criticality. Otherwise they can lead to polarization and misinformation. And we've seen a lot of this lately. So this is a, a, a crucial, I would say, digital literacy that we need to help our students to develop. Now, the question um, uh, is a little bit obvious, but it will help us to recap and give you the opportunity to reflect on what we said 
why do language students, our students, need these skills? Over to you. What do, why do they need all these skills? Someone might argue that, um, Sophia, these skills are for IT people, not for language teachers to teach or to integrate. We do not live in the Stone Age anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. <laughs> yeah, I need to develop it first. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. You said you said something very important. Yeah, I will raise it later. Thank you. So even more do, 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 even more difficult to practice these skills in a foreign language. Thank you, Catherine. If they want to communicate effectively. Uh, in the language they need to use the vocabulary that everybody uses in real life. Thank you, Florencia. John, they will be using uh, their languages within a digital context. Yes, increasingly digital. Exactly, exactly. Because they are survival skills. Yes, Gina, thank you. So, absolutely. So, uh, yes, these competencies are um, of significant value, and I'm very glad that you agree um, they're of significant value to students um, who might be involved in language learning practices, you know, research, project-based learning, create content, blended learning, um, etc. But they do need these literacies, as you very well said, to participate effectively in online communities. Um, for, for online learning, we advise teachers to create communities online. Do students have the skills to participate, communicate and collaborate with other people online? Hmm? So it is not enough to tell teachers, uh, create communities online. How, how do students have the skills? Um, uh, we can set up wonderful projects online and give attention to the pedagogy and all that, but uh, be challenged to deliver because of that, because students don't know what it means to collaborate online. Um, create ownership and avoid plagiarism. We ask students to do research and project work, etc., but we all know that they copy from the internet and they pass it off as their own not always because they're lazy or because they want to cheat, not always. Many times it is because they don't know how to synthesize information into their own original argument. Evaluate the credibility of online content, fake news. A whole political campaigns have been won based on fake news. Don't you think so? So it is very important for our students, um, especially when we use um, authentic materials to, uh, to help them to develop uh, these, uh, these uh, competences. Manage digital distractions in class or when they are doing homework. They are not distracted because they are lazy, not only. Uh, it is because the technologies that, off, that offer us such massive, massive potential are also chronically distracting us. Some people refer to this as an addiction, but I wouldn't use this term as the evidence is not conclusive and it is a medical term. So I wouldn't like to say addiction, but a more accurate term uh, to refer to this over connectivity is FOMO, fear of missing out, which is a form of anxiety or obsession or compulsion. So algorithms and digital devices are geared to create this FOMO and thus uh, challenge our concentration. So FOMO is a very real situation and, and can take a toll both professionally and personally. And when it comes to our students, it can interfere with the learning. And that's why managing digital distractions is a learning skill. Um, and of course, of course, perhaps this is the most, um, you know, relevant to our days. Uh, they do need these literacies to learn online. We often say that teachers um, should be trained uh, to teach online, but what about students? 
just because they can use Instagram and TikTok and they're fluent users of technology doesn't mean that they know how to learn online, how to communicate, how to curate content, how to manage their time, etc. So we need to help them to develop these skills. Perhaps if we are teaching online, as I will say in a bit, perhaps in small chunks, in small bits um, every day, especially for online teachers and remote teachers, this is extremely important and it cannot wait because students need these literacies every time they are online. It will make such a big difference to their learning and it will also make your life much easier. So, checking the time. Okay, so um, what can we do? Um, how can we integrate digital literacies in the language classroom? So I would say that task-based learning, project-based learning uh, are my preferred approaches to integrate these literacies because the primary focus here of every activity is the meaningful task. Uh, while the language is the instrument that students use to complete the task. So I personally love, love um, task-based activities because they give students a meaningful reason to do something, as opposed to just do an exercise on um, a past tense, for example, or do drilling. Um, so the other way that I find useful here is, um, especially during the pandemic, uh, that we don't have the time to redesign the approaches and the syllabi. Um, let's face it, let's be realistic. Um, is bite-sized uh, digital literacies, small chunks that may take 10 minutes from your classroom, but they will make such a big difference. So let's give some examples here. Um, Task-based learning. Um, and of course it works face-to-face -face online and it is excellent for uh, asynchronous, for the asynchronous mode as well. So you set the task and ask students to produce something. Of course, this something depends on the level that you are teaching and what digital literacy you want to develop. So I'm not going to be prescriptive here. Uh, we would need uh, perhaps, uh, you know, five more sessions uh, to analyze and be uh, give um, many examples for every digital literacy. But I will give an example that you can adjust and adapt. Um, so let's say that they need to work in groups of three, four to create advertisements. This is a great activity for boosting their media literacies as well. And I even use it with my postgraduate students. So first you need to teach them some elements of good collaboration especially if they are going to do this asynchronously. So how to negotiate, how to agree, how to disagree, how not to let the group down. Uh, one may need to be the coordinator. You said previously that assign roles. Um, you may, uh, for example, um, yes, want to assign roles. So um, they can create uh, short videos for advertisements. Uh, there are various tools uh, and they can simply use their phones if you don't want to go, you know, into details how, uh, you know, what filmmaking tools they can use. Or you can visit Joe's website where he has lots of resources there. Um, so students have to think of catchy phrases and convincing ways to market a project and then to analyze uh, whether the messages were based on values, assumptions, fallacies, etc. And see from the advertiser's perspective how media is used to influence opinion. And then see the other group's projects and evaluate them. Another example. Uh, which can be used with um, teenagers as well, or young learners, but also university students. Uh, students create short how-to videos or presentations with narration. Um, a tool that I love is Screencast-O-Matic, 
um, but you can use any screencast tool, really. It is not the tool. It is the design of the activity that matters. Tools don't create learning. They don't cause learning. Activities cause learning. Teachers cause learning, okay? So depending on the level, it can be how to draw a heart, for example, for the little ones. So they create how-to videos, how to make a recipe, how to keep your study space organized when you learn online, how to stay safe online, how to use technology, how to use an app, eh? how to create stories on Instagram. Teenagers would love to create a how-to tutorial on that. So students create these five-minute projects via uh, Screencast-O-Matic or whatever tool you will choose and also are required to give feedback to at least two other students. So they share this on the LMS, your Moodle, Edmodo, whatever LMS you have for students to share it. And then they are asked to watch their classmates' screencasts and comment, give comments. Um, what I love about this is that it ticks all the boxes and it can be part of their assessment as well. Social learning, scaffolding each other, even if it doesn't go well, uh, as a group, they might, for example, have some rows and conflicts, even if it doesn't go well, they can reflect on what didn't go well and understand that collaboration is not easy, that it is a skill that they need to develop. It doesn't come by default. It is a 21st century skill. It is a digital literacy. So, ah. <clears throat> uh, Yes. Now, closing. With machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, I referred a lot to artificial intelligence and uh, we will see, we will read a lot about it um, in the future. Uh, and translation tools, you mentioned trans translation tools, um, becoming increasingly, increasingly accurate and sophisticated. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion as to whether people will actually need to master a foreign language at all in the future. For example, with tools such as um, Google Translate or even better Microsoft Stream, oh my God, it's amazing. Why would people need to learn a language in the future? Um, yes, all these, will generate a lot of concern in the near future. But my answer to this is that machines will never be able to teach values, to empower uh, students uh, with literacies such as the ones that we looked at today. Another 21st century literacies um, such as empathy, inclusion, well-being, le leadership, adaptability, etc. Computers are and will always be most effective, perfect, at performing routine tasks. The kind of teaching and assessing that very, very probably will no longer need people to do in the future. So I think that if we realize this, then we will stop perceiving technology as a threat to our profession but as, an, as a powerful ally that can play an instrumental role in our efforts to develop students' language skills and the new literacies we talked about today. So yes, uh, the world that we live in is highly complex, fast-paced, ever-changing, and students need new literacies to learn and function, but to echo Kobo, the author of a fantastic open access book that talks about privacy and how our data is used. And you will find it in the references. Um, and um, I would recommend that you read it, it's fantastic. Education is still the most powerful tool to prepare people to function in these highly complex environments, such as the world that we live in. So, our role is really, really powerful.
So thank you very, very much for coming in and for being so interactive and fantastic. So here are the references. Feel free to take a picture. Take a picture of the references. Feel free to take a picture. Lots of comments. Oh, okay. And if you want to refer to this presentation, here is the citation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your lovely comments. Thank you. And here are my contact details if you want to um, follow me, follow my work, and I will follow you back and, um, you know, be part of my uh, network. Thank you very much. And of course, um, I'm more than welcome to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you very much, all. Thank you so much, uh, Sophia, for this lively and crystal clear presentation about